<clears throat> okay. Luke chapter 21, verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with big gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen and what will be the sign, the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he. And the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pest pestilence and in various place places, you know, and beautiful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you'll be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you'll bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand not how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You'll be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. When you see Jerusalem be, being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment, the fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful you will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled um, by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be times in the sun, moons and stars on the, the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your, up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the tree. When it sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near. Even though when you see these things happen, happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the faith of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Amen. I love my message is the Son of Man will come with the power and great glory. Key verse is verse 27. So let's read verse 27 uh, together. So last week, we learned that we are not born to die. We are born to live. We are born to be immortal children of God, who will be like the angels, glorious and majestic. So God wants us to live a full life. God does not want us to live a defeated life on this earth. And he wants us to live a full life and give our fruits to God, then God will be glorified. But in this world, we must suffer. So that's why Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The second coming of Jesus Christ 
is the most glorious, most anticipated event in history. So there are some statistics here. There are about 330 general prophecies in the Bible about Jesus Christ. 110 of them are about his first coming and 220 of them are about his second coming. So there is a huge amount of scripture that focuses on the second coming of Jesus Christ. Someone has estimated that over 1,500 verses in the Old Testament look to the return of the Messiah in glory and judgment. Jesus referred to it 20 times, and there are over 50 times in the New Testament that we are warned that he is coming. Does the second coming matter? Yes, it matters more than anything because the end of the story is the reason for the story. The end of history is the reason for history. The reason for Genesis is to get to Revelation. So in today's passage, we learn from our Lord himself the important features of his return, the signs leading up to it, and how we are to prepare for it. It's going to be a great privilege to study this passage to see how it all ends. Look at verses 5 and 6. Some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with the beautiful stones and with the gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. This is the picture of the temple. It's a beautiful, it's gold plated on the outside. And when the sun shone, it just brightly shining with gold color. So disciples were not from Jerusalem, they were from Galilee. So we would say that they were country bumpkins. They would have seldom been to Jerusalem and thus would have seen the grandeur of the temple as tourists. So temple was impressive, not only for its beauty, but also for its size. The foundation stones were almost the size of box cars, 27 feet long, 18 feet wide, and 12 feet high. The temple was indeed both great and glorious, especially to the disciples of Jesus. So Jesus' remarks were especially devastating since the temple was the heart and soul of Israel's worship. To them, the destruction of the temple was unthinkable. So in verse 7, they voiced their concerns. Teacher, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? So it is clear that the disciples viewed what Jesus said about the destruction of the temple as a synonymous for the end of the world. They were, of course, mistaken because a lengthy period of time would intervene between Jerusalem's, Jerusalem's fall and the second coming of Jesus. But there was a connection between judgment executed upon the nation and the temple on the one hand and the final judgment at the end of the age. So the disciple question had two parts. They want to know, uh, first, when will all this take place? Referring to the destruction of the temple. And second, will there be any sign ahead of time? So Lord's reply comprises what is known as the Olivet Discourse, which is the greatest sermon ever preached on the end of times. The disciples, like many of us today, were concerned about the wrong things. They wanted to know the information that would be of no value to them, other than to satisfy their own curiosity. Jesus was more interested in affecting their conduct rather than satisfying their curiosity. Jesus knew that if the disciples look for signs, they would be susceptible to deception. So in the midst of all these tumultuous end time events, Jesus specifically warns the believers about some real dangers. So let me just quickly go over three great dangers the disciples should avoid. So first, Jesus warns, don't be deceived. Toward the end of the age, 
there will be an increasing deception and tremendous potential for people to be deceived. So in verse 8, Jesus says, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. Uh, maybe you, you are too young to remember 2011. So one false prophet claimed that the end of the world was coming on May 21st, and there was a mass hysteria. And this is exactly what Jesus warned against. Many people are susceptible to deception because they want a false message of a peace and assurance, and they want to escape uh, sufferings. Cory Tambom, this is a Cory Tambom, and her father were Dutch watchmakers who hid the Jews during World War II. And they were caught, and she was arrested and was sent to a concentration camp. Her most famous book, The Hiding Place, shared hope in God while she was imprisoned at the concentration camp. And a Hiding Place is a biography that recounts the story of her family's efforts and she, how she found and shared hope in God while she was imprisoned at the concentration camp. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about. She wrote a letter in 1974 warning against not preparing for coming persecution. So this is what she wrote. There are some among us teaching that there will be no tribulation, that the Christians will be able to escape all this. These are the false teachers that Jesus was warning against, warning us to expect in the latter days. Most of them have a little knowledge of what is already going on across the world. I've been in countries where the saints are already suffering terrible persecution. In China, before the communists took power in 1949, the Christians were told, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you will be raptured. Then came a terrible persecution during the communist reign. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Many more lost their faith, disillusioned and disappointed. Later, I heard a bishop from China say, sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them that Jesus would come first and rapture them before suffering. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribulation comes, to stand and not faint. End quote. This is what Corey Tambum said. Uh, second warning, Jesus warns, do not be afraid. Look at verse 9. When you hear wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. In verse 9, Jesus corrects the mistaken notion that these signs of the end of the age are infallible indications that the end of the age is immediately in sight. So for example, whenever there are blood moons, some preachers say, the end is near. But Jesus said, Jesus said clearly, the end will not come right away. In verse 11 also, Jesus speaks about great earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places. The pestilences are like a disease, like COVID-19. So according to Matthew's account of the Lord's message, he summarized all of this as merely the beginning of birth pains. Do you know birth pains? Maybe only those who gave birth know birth pains. So as time of the birth gets closer, the pain increases, intensity increases, and frequency grows. So likewise, earthquakes, wars, and disasters will increase and intensify as the time of Jesus coming draws near, but at the end of birth pains, there is a new life, and, and, child cry, new life comes. Likewise, at the end of this, all these terrible calam calamities, there will be a new world. So instead of being afraid, 
We should look forward to Jesus' second coming and new life with him. So look at verses 12 and 13. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. The persecution being described here is something that will take place in the immediate future and also throughout history. Rather than being blown by persecution, whether it is religious, secular, or domestic, we are to persevere, to endure, to stand firm. We are not to be frightened into failing to be a witness for Jesus Christ. So that's why Jesus promised in verse 19, stand firm and you will win life. So let me also quote again, Corrie Tambum's story. The Corrie Tambum told the following story in, in, in a letter. Several years ago, I was in Africa in a nation where new government had come into power. The first night I was there, some of the Christians were co commanded to come to the police station to register. When they arrived, they were arrested, and the same night, they were executed. The next day, same thing happened with other Christians. The third day, it was the same. All the Christians in the district was being systematically murdered. The fourth day, I was to speak in a little church. The people came, but they were filled with fear and tension. All during the service, they were looking at each other. They were eyes asking, will this one I'm sitting beside be the next one killed? Will I be the next one? I told them a story out of my childhood. When I was a little girl, I went to my father and said, Daddy, I'm afraid that I, I will never be strong enough to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Tell me, said the father, when you take a tra train trip to Amsterdam, when do I give you the money for the ticket? Three weeks before? No, daddy, you give the money for the ticket just before we get on the train. Just right, that's right, my father said. So it is with God's strength. Our Father in heaven knows when you will need the strength to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. He will supply all you need just in time. Suddenly, a spirit of joy descended upon that church, and the people began to sing in the suite by and by. There's a land that is a far brighter than day. And by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to, put, to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Then, but later that week, half the congregation of that church was executed. So but I was so happy that the Lord used me to encourage these people with the word of God. That Jesus said he had not only overcome the world, but to all who remained faithful to the end, he would give a crown of life. So how can he prepare? How can he get ready for the persecution? First, we need to feed on the word of God, digest it, and make it part of our living. That will mean disciplined Bible study each day as we not only memorize the Bible passages, but to put the principles to work in our lives. And second, we need to develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just Jesus of yesterday, Jesus of history, but Jesus, life-changing Jesus of today who is still alive and is sitting at the right hand of God. And thirdly, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is no optional command of the Bible. It is absolutely necessary. Those early disciples could have never stood up under the persecution of the Jews and the Romans without the Holy Spirit's guidance and encouragement. We'll never be able to stand in the tribulation without it. 
So in the coming persecution, especially people's love will grow cold because we are so under hard press. It's very difficult to survive ourselves. But we must be ready to help each other and encourage one another. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, especially love, should be the dominant force of every Christian's life. That mighty inner strengthening of the Holy Spirit will help us through. So thirdly, Jesus warns, don't be distracted. Look at verses 34 through 36. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with the carousing, drunkenness, and anxieties of life. And that they will close on you suddenly like a trap. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So look at the parallel account in Matthew's Gospel. As it was in the days of Noah, it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So here Jesus said that when the end of the age comes, it will be like it was in Noah's time. So when you read that, we tend to think that he's saying that it will be evil as it was in the Noah's time. But when he says that they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, he's not describing something evil. Although there was a great evil in that day, that is not the problem that is being described here. So Jesus' message is that people across the world in that day were caught up doing the ordinary things, living as if this life is all there is. They were completely ignoring the warnings of upcoming judgment instead of turning to God in repentance. Jesus says, that's the way it will be before he returns. Look at verse 27. At the time, they, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with a power and great glory. When Jesus came into the world the first time, no one noticed that he was born except a few shepherds. He was born and laid in a manger. He was despised, rejected, and crucified. After he died, people thought that they would never see him again. But by the power of God, he was raised from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And he will come again. This time he will come in power and great glory. Paul says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with a trumpet call of God. He will come with the thousands upon thousands of his holy angels. He will send his angels to gather his elect from four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. He will open the book of life and call his people's name one by one. And will respond with a sense of victory. Here I am. Jesus will give us a crown of righteousness, glory, and life. And we will be with him forever. What a glorious day it will be. This is the hope of all believers. This hope will not disappoint us. This hope gives us inner strength to endure all kinds of hardships while we live in this world. Sometimes we think that believing in Jesus does not matter so much. But the, at the moment of Jesus coming, believing in Jesus will be everything and the only thing that matters. So that's why Jesus said in verse 28, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. When you have Jesus' hope in our hearts, even in the midst of trouble and hardship, we can live with a sense of victory. Lift up your head in this troubled world. So in conclusion, so when you read this passage of persecution and famines and all the troubles, we get frightened. But remember Jesus' promise, stand firm and you will win life. So let's summarize Jesus' warning of three great dangers while waiting for his coming. So first, we are not to be deceived 
into thinking that we can escape the suffering. And second, we are not to be frightened into a failing to be a witness for Christ. And third, we are not to be distracted into living as if this life is all there is. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus who is coming again in power and great glory. May God help us to be ready for his coming by living as a witness of Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.